morning. Good morning. Welcome to First United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Will. We are delighted to have you here as we worship God together today. What a beautiful fall Sunday morning. Thank you, Lord, for the beautiful weather. Just a few announcements as we begin worship today. Um, as you may have seen in your email, if you, if you get emails from the church, we are beginning a, a new flooring project over in Langford Hall of our Fellowship Hall, and it's getting some age on it, a lot of the tile is starting to crack, and so we were going to have to do something, and so while we could still get the same flooring that we put in the rest of the building, uh, the trustees and finance decided to move forward with this, and then uh, uh, come to find out, Dale and Gail Kiger uh, put forth a, an opportunity, a challenge for the congregation that uh, they would do a, a dollar for dollar matching um, donation, so if the congregation would raise up to $10,000, they will give $10,000, so thank you for that, and so just to uh, if you would be willing to give a special gift to the building fund for this project, we, we certainly would appreciate that. Um, the Young at Heart, our senior group, is going to meet Tuesday at 11 a.m. over in Langford Hall, uh, so make note of that. Administrative Council will be meeting tonight, and also our children and youth will be meeting tonight at 5 p.m. There will be no kids or youth programming next Sunday. Uh, next Sunday, next weekend is fall break for the schools, and uh, several are going to be out of town. So. No youth programming next week, but this week at 5 o'clock. And uh, New Member Sunday, if you are interested in joining the church, uh, we're going to have a New Member Sunday on October the 30th. If that Sunday works for you, uh, we'd be glad to uh, invite you to join in membership or uh, any other Sunday. We'll, we'll be glad to have you join in membership. Just let me know. Uh, the Breakaways, which is our young adult group, is, is hosting a book drive for the church library. And Katie Green is working on that project. You can see her information there. And I think that's just about all the announcements except for uh, we have a sign-up sheet for our, our fall festival, the Halloween festival. We need some help for that. It's a, it's a big outreach that we do here in our community on October 29th. So if you be, would, would be willing to help with that, uh, make sure to pass that around. And Tommy Easterling is going to share a little bit about flood buckets and how we can help with the flood uh, relief and hurricane relief down in, in Florida. Sometimes living Christian life can be a little uncomfortable and discerning. Jesus told us the great commandment is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, our soul, our mind, our spirit, and our neighbor as ourselves. And over 2,000 years of philosophy and theology, we have come to define our neighbor as every human being on the planet who has a claim on our generosity, mercy, <coughs> hope, and love. We know just recently the hurricane destroyed much of the Gulf Coast of Florida. We received an email this week from UNCOR. And if you're not familiar with UNCOR, it is the United Methodist Committee on Relief. It is our worldwide disaster response team. UNCOR's philosophy is a little different than others. Immediately after the hurricane, we had groups like Samaritan's Purse, the Baptist Men, the uh, American Red Cross, who flood the place with water, food, shelter, which is extremely necessary. But UNCOR is more into the restoration, rebuilding process. We're usually the last to arrive on scene, but we're also the last to leave. And one of the major things that they need are what they call flood buckets. And flood buckets is a five gallon can with a lid. But there's a list of supplies that go inside. Gloves, sponges, scrubbing brushes, air freshener, detergents, cleaning solutions, etc. If this bucket were completely full with all the correct supplies, cost would be about $75 per bucket. And they request that each bucket be exactly the same. So the now committee has decided that our 12 basket ministry for October will be flood buckets for the folks in Florida. We ask that you will make a contribution to this ministry, put on your check 12 baskets ministry or hurricane relief or 
blood buckets or whatever you like so that we can identify. We will take all the money that we receive during the month of October and go purchase all the supplies so everything will be identical to what they want. And our youth have agreed to do the assembly the first week in November. So if you would be generous in your hurricane relief aid so that we can put as many buckets together as possible and get them to the folks in Florida who really need. When they go back to their homes, the ones that are there are still standing, they're going to find severe water damage, mold damage. They're going to have to start tearing down drywall and walls and scrubbing mud out of the house, and it's going to be a mess. This is what they need to assist them. So I thank you in advance on behalf of the Mountain Dew. Thank you, Tony. As we continue worship this morning, let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, it's so good to be in your house. Uh, Lord, we're thankful for your presence in this place. We pray now that you would help us to center our hearts and minds on you, Lord, to worship you with all we have. So come, Holy Spirit, and fill the hearts of your faithful. Rekindle in us the fire of your love, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together for our opening hymn. <coughs> standing as we profess our faith together through this historic affirmation of our faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered by the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Invite your ushers forward for the morning offering. <laughs> Let's pray. 
Father, we come now to return our tithe and offering to you. Pray that you bless these gifts. Multiply them and bless the giver in Jesus' name. be seated and I invite our children now for children's time.
Have you guys ever had to prepare for anything before? We did do this last year, didn't we? <laughs> you know what I'm going to talk about. Yes, so have, have anybody um, had to like prepare to go on a vacation? Yeah? What happens if you get ready to go on vacation and you don't pack all your stuff and you, you don't get ready for it? What happens? You wouldn't have anything. You wouldn't have any of the stuff you needed, right? Or, you know, it's getting colder outside. Um, what happens if you go outside and you're not wearing warm clothes? You'll be really cold, right? And it's going to get colder and colder. And you might even get sick if you don't wear nice warm clothes outside, right? So it's important for us to be prepared for things in life. So um, one of the things that I wanted to prepare for today, so one of my favorite things, one of my favorite sports to play is basketball. So we did already do this. Yes, we did. But not, you know, some of, some of you folks weren't here earlier, so we're going to talk to everybody about this one more time. So you don't, you don't, get, to, you don't get to say anything. You don't need to sit. You don't need to sit. So, everybody else <laughs> can talk to me. Um, so, one of my favorite things to play is basketball. So, if I were to not prepare and go play basketball, could I play basketball very good in the clothes that I have on right now? Probably not, right? I wouldn't be a very good basketball player in my nice church clothes. What would I need to go play basketball with? What do you guys think is in my bag? I would need a basketball. Yes, I do. I need my sneakers, right? I need to be able to have good shoes to be able to play. That would have been smart. Yes, they got me on that in the last service too. So she said maybe a water bottle. I forgot to pack my water, so I'm not as prepared as I should be, right? So I do. I do have my gym clothes though. I have my t-shirt and my shorts and my socks and my sneakers and my ball, right? Yeah. All right, so yes, it's so important for us to be prepared for the things that we want to do and the things that are important to us in our lives, right? One of the things that's very important to us as Christian people is to be able to tell people why it is we love God, right? So the Bible tells us that we should be prepared to tell people why it is we love God. And one of the things that Pastor Will's been teaching us is that we can say that we love God because God loved us so much he sent his son Jesus to die for my sins and then he rose again three days later, right? So that's something that we can remember. If anybody ever asks people, well, why do you go to church? Or why are you a Christian person? Or why, why do you love God so much? You can say, because God loved me first, right? And he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for me and my sins and then he rose again, right? So let's pray about that. God, we thank you so much that you love us so much that you sent your son, Jesus. And God, we just ask that you help us to be prepared to answer when people ask us um, why we love you, Lord. God, just help us to be able to always be ready to answer and be prepared and um, to show other people your love, Lord. We pray this all in your son, Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you guys. You can go ahead and stare at the children's church. time this morning. I invite your attention to our prayer list in the bulletin. Certainly keep all those folks um, in your prayers. Continue to lift up the family of, of Harold Moss. We celebrated his life here in the church earlier this week. Um, ask that you pray for uh, Emily, and, and Emily and Jason Cook who attend the early service. Emily's father is not doing well, Mickey Penninger. Uh, so keep Mickey uh, in your prayers. Are there other prayer concerns or praises to lift up before our, our church family today? Will, pray. Yes. Our youngest son, Justin, is going to visit their first week wedding in North Carolina. All right. And they're back in North Carolina. All right. They started in the Army, but now they're All right. Justin, good to have you back. Happy anniversary, y'all. Today's friend Wanda Hawks. Any other prayer concerns or praises 
to lift up this morning. Yes, ma'am. Uh, speak in the court of your spouse or free to the court of your intake child hospice in okay. in the state of Mississippi that stands in for us. They called hospice in for Fred Poirier. Yes. Pray for, pray for him. Any others? Uh, Joel Maynard, who usually sits back there on the back of the <laughs> with his wife, uh, Joel's mother uh, is not doing well, uh, so keep uh, keep them in your prayers as well. Are there any others? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Holy God, it is good to be in your house, Lord, just to be with our brothers and sisters in Christ, to enjoy fellowship, to enjoy time, just to center on you, Lord, to, to worship you. Lord, you're worthy of our worship. You're worthy of our adoration and praise, not just for what you do for us, but for simply who you are. God, you are able to do so much more than we could ever ask or pray for or hope for, but Lord, we just come bringing our petitions uh, to you. Uh, Lord, standing in the gap for those in need. We pray for your healing. We pray for your peace, for your comfort. God, we are grateful that you're always there, that you're ready to help us when we call upon you. So we acknowledge you. We worship you. We thank you today. We invite you to look inside of our hearts and minds, and Lord, we seek forgiveness for times that we have sinned, for times that we have sinned against others and against you. Lord, we're thankful for your grace and mercy. We just pray for your forgiveness. Lord, continue to mold us. Make us into the kind of people, the kind of Christians you'd have us to be. Lord, being intentional about growing in our faith, being intentional about sharing our faith, defending our faith, being prepared to give an answer to our faith. Lord, help us to seek you first in all things. We pray for our church today, both locally and globally, Lord, that you would strengthen us, Lord, that you would bind us together in your love, Lord, that you would help us as we reach out in concern and in service to your world that is hurting. Lord, help us to just to be effective in sharing your good news, the gospel message. Lord, you put this church here many years ago to be about your work, Lord. Continue to work in us. Continue to move in us. Help us to be sensitive to your leadership, the guidance of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray for our, our country, for our leaders. We pray for all those that put themselves in harm's way for our protection, for our military servicemen and women. Lord, may you watch over them. We pray for a healing of our land and a healing of our world. Lord, I pray for the message you've given me this week. Lord, that it might be effective and accomplish your purpose this day. We pray all these things in the matchless name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
This morning we're continuing on in our sermon series, Prepared, How to Defend Our Faith Without Losing Our Mind, Being Prepared. You remember last week we were working on the one-liners. How do we respond when people ask us about our faith or question our faith? What's the thing that we can say? We're going to show a video, kind of the bumper uh, video, of people that weren't quite prepared for the job interview. Carol, next please. Jill. Yeah. Hi, Jill. Nice to meet you. David. Nice, nice to meet you, David. Nice to meet you. My shirt. Thanks. It's my favorite. What makes you qualify for this position? Tell me why you like to work for this company. That's that's a toughie. I don't know. I really know why. Because you're hiring. Hey, tell me about your biggest uh, career accomplishment. I'm set on that, baby. I don't know why you need to know that. speak up about our faith when we are asked. Before we go too much further, let's stop and pray together. And as you pray with me this morning, don't forget to pray for me. Let's pray. Oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts and minds together be found acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So as Christians, we have a lot of information rolling around in our heads and we, we love our faith and we love what we believe and we have all this information running around but are we prepared to speak about it to say something about our faith one of the most frustrating things i think about being a christian is those moments when someone might ask you a question about your faith or make a comment about your faith and you know it would really take 15 minutes of a deep conversation to explain it all but they're they're rarely even giving you 15 seconds kind of those hit and run comments or hit and run questions like so do you believe all that stuff in the bible or so what how can you believe that and, and they kind of walk on they're, they're hit and run questions hit and run comments it's the uncle at the Thanksgiving table who has the three different comments that he makes about religion kind of in a rotation every year and it kind of leaves you stunned. You're not quite sure how to respond or it's the, the cousin who's really secular but she went to church one time and she has this one story about church and it wasn't that great but she shares that story and you're not really sure how to respond to, to her. What do we say to those people who are really not that interested, those people who don't give us a whole lot of time and even less interest? What are the sound bites? What are the short answers that we can give to change the trajectory of the conversation? That's what we're really after. What can we say? How do we speak up? How can we be prepared? What do we say when there's little time and less interest? Last week, we looked at the advice of one of the greatest evangelists, the Apostle Peter, Simon Peter, the ex-fisherman turned disciple. And this is what Peter said, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. It says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you the reason for the hope that you have. Always be prepared to give an answer. The Greek word there is defense. Always be prepared to give a defense to everyone for the answer, uh, for the reason that you follow Jesus. Be prepared to defend your hope, your confidence in Jesus Christ. So essentially, it's asking the question, why have you decided to follow Jesus? That's the question that we need to be prepared to answer. Why have you chosen to follow Jesus? I don't know about you, but for me, this is good news because you're not being asked to defend the Christian worldview. You're not being asked to defend, defend all the Christians out there behaving badly. You're not being asked to defend and, and to explain every little bit of the Bible. So it's okay, you don't have to be a Bible scholar. But you, what you are being asked to do is just defend this question, to answer this question. Why have you personally chosen to follow Jesus? We remember that Peter gave an answer last week, and his answer was just one word, the resurrection. The resurrection. 
Peter, he saw Jesus die on the cross. And then a few days later, he had breakfast with him on the beach. And Peter's like, you know, if, if anyone predicts their death and resurrection and, and follows through with it, you just follow them. It's that simple. For Peter, it was the, the resurrection. And so when we're crafting our sentence, when we're crafting our statement, our answer to the question, why have you chosen to follow Jesus? I think it ought to include the resurrection as well. So the sentence that we crafted last week, this is my suggestion. Feel free to put it in your own words. But my suggestion was this. You know, for me, it's simple. I believe Jesus died for my sin and he rose from the dead. For me, it's simple. I believe Jesus died for my sin and he rose from the dead. Today, I want to add something to that. I want to add a little bit on to that. And just bear with me. It says, for me, it's simple. I believe Jesus died for my sin and rose from the dead. But I don't believe it just because the Bible says so. No, it's way better than that. It's way better than that. And so this morning, we're going to talk about the way better than that. Now, the Bible, the Bible is very important to us, right? A lot of Sundays I'll say something like, well, this is not just a book. It's a library, right, of many different books, many different styles of writing written over a long span of time. But we believe that this library is unlike any other on earth, that God breathed his, his life and his spirit and his truth onto its pages. It's inspired, it's eternal, and it's true. And so we're, we're Bible lifters in our church we we respect the authority of god's word but you know what we don't worship the bible you, you understand that we don't worship the bible we worship the one that the bible points to and that is jesus christ the foundation of our faith is jesus christ but here's the thing some people like to poke fun at the bible some parts of the bible are hard to understand yes but people like to poke fun. A lot of times they'll poke fun and they'll ask questions about the Old Testament. Now believe me, uh, there is some crazy stuff in the Old Testament. There, there really is. In fact, if you're a new Christian, I would advise you as a pastor, I would advise you to start the New Testament. Just get, get the foundation of Jesus Christ and then go back and read the Old Testament and see which was all preparing for Jesus. The Old Testament can be a little hard to understand. Are, are there parts of the Bible that seem to be in conflict yes are there parts of the bible that don't always agree with our modern worldview yeah there are and a lot of young people our young people if they're not prepared they'll, they'll go to college and somebody will kind of you know pull one of pull one link out of their their foundation they'll question something about genesis or the or the creation and their faith will come crumbling down because they didn't have the solid foundation which is jesus christ the foundation of our faith. So when take, people take shots at the, at the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, here's something you can say. Here's something you can speak up and answer with, defend your faith with, if, if you will. You could say that, well, the Old Testament, which was the Hebrew Bible when Jesus was walking the earth, we say, well, we take scripture seriously because Jesus took it seriously. We take the Old Testament seriously because Jesus took it seriously. Jesus believed it was inspired. Jesus came to fulfill it. In fact, in Matthew's gospel, Matthew 5, 17, Jesus says, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. No, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So we take the Old Testament seriously because Jesus took it seriously. I mean, think about it for a moment. What's more compelling to say, well, I believe in the creation story because it's in the Bible. Or to say, well, I believe in the creation story because Jesus believed in the creation story. Well, there's a difference there, right? Jesus leveraged the creation story. Jesus preached on the creation from time to time. In fact, in, in, Matthew, in Matthew 19, uh, verse 4 and 5, Jesus talks about the, the creation in Adam and Eve. He says, haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the creator made them male and female, and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. Where have you heard that before? At a wedding, right? I use that a lot of ways. So when someone is trying to debate or criticize or if you're getting uh, baited into an argument. And by the way, church, please don't, don't get into an argument. It's not worth it. No one has ever came to faith in Jesus Christ because they lost an argument. Be gentle. Be respectful. 
be humble. But when someone's asking you a question or maybe poking fun or making a comment about the Old Testament, you can say something like this. Here's your, here's your short answer. Here's your sound bite. Yeah, there's some crazy stuff in there. But since Jesus took the Old Testament seriously, I do too. There you go. There's your sound bite. But you can almost hear the objection, right? You can almost hear their answer to that. They said, but, but, but wait, wait, wait. Now, isn't your knowledge of Jesus based on the Bible? And aren't you defending the Bible with the Bible? And the answer to that is no. No, absolutely not. And so we're going to move into the most important part of our conversation today. The word Bible, what does the word Bible mean? Anybody know? Book. And more specifically, books. You've got, the, you've got the cheat card right here beside me. Books. Right, it's a Latin word that's derived from a Greek term that means books. And we know that the Bible is not a book along it is books, a collection of books, a, a library, and the Old Testament, the New Testament. And, and in the middle you have the, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is the biography section of Scripture. And I think the Gospels are the most important part of the Bible, of the library, the Gospels. But here, hear this, church. I want you to really listen to the words. Church, we don't believe that the Gospels are reliable because they're in the Bible. We believe that the Gospels are included in the Bible because they were already considered a reliable source. You hear me, church? We don't believe that the Gospels are reliable just because they're in the Bible. We believe that the Gospels are reliable because... <laughs> They were already considered reliable before they were included in the Bible. The Gospels are considered reliable because of who wrote them. Two eyewitnesses and two, of their, and two friends of eyewitnesses. The Gospels are considered reliable because of who wrote them and when they are written. All right. History time, you history buffs. If you were in the early service, you can't, you can't answer. You can't play along. <laughs> Kelly was the only one that got it right in early service. Congratulations. All right. 70 AD. What happened in the history of the world in 70 AD, particularly August of 70 AD? Anyone? We, thank you, Terry. I, I knew you'd get it. <laughs> the, the tabernacle was destroyed. The temple in Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. The Jewish temple was destroyed. And it's an important day because the Jewish temple was destroyed. But more importantly, it marked the end of a seven-year war. There was a seven-year war against the Jews. You remember when Jesus walked the earth that they were, the people at that time, they were wanting Jesus to be kind of that, that soldier, you know, that would help them overthrow the Romans. Well, Jesus, he didn't come to do that. That's, that's not, he came to overthrow death and, and sin. But finally, the Jews, some of them, they got what they wanted. And so they entered into this war with the Romans to try to overthrow the Roman uh, control. And it was a seven-year war. It was a bloody war. And the last two years of the war, it's called the First Jewish War. The last two years, the entire Roman legion circled the entire city of Jerusalem. And they essentially choked them out for two years. Choked them out of all resources, food, water. And eventually they broke through the fortified walls of Jerusalem. And at that time, the Romans were mad. You see, Vespasian was the, was the leader in charge. And then his son took over his son with Titus took over and they were angry the Romans were mad they had been in this war for seven years and the last two years had been really hard and Josephus who was an ancient historical writer who was there he was an eyewitness to all of this he writes about what takes place Josephus writes that over a million Jews were killed in this siege a million Jews. Now, some scholars would say, well, that, that's a little bit of an exaggeration. It was more like 300,000, but still, 300,000, a million, whatever, it's a lot. Listen to what he writes, Josephus. It says, The slaughter within was even more dreadful than the spectacle from without. Men and women, old and young, insurgents and priests, those who fought and those who entreated mercy, were hewn down in indiscriminate carnage. The legionnaires had to clamber over heaps of dead to carry on the work of extermination. So why am I telling you about this, this monumental event in the history of the world? It happened in 70 AD. Have you, any, any, you ever read that in Scripture? You ever found that in the New Testament? No. 
It's not in there. Do you know why? It hadn't happened yet. The scriptures of the New Testament, the Gospels, they were all written before 70 AD. If they were written after 70 AD, it would have been mentioned. This would have been mentioned. It would have made a lot of pages in scripture. But no, the New Testament, the Gospels, they were all written before 70 AD. So within 40 years after Jesus died, and Jesus died and was resurrected somewhere 32, 33 AD. So within the next 40 years, the Gospels, the New Testament, are written and circulated in a time when eyewitnesses are still living. That's so important. The New Testament was written, the Gospels were written at a time when there were eyewitnesses, people who saw with their own eyes what Jesus had done, people who saw him with the miracles, they saw him bring the dead back to life, they, they saw him with, with the, the bread, and they saw him heal the, the sick, they saw him die on the cross, and they saw him resurrected days later. They, they saw the birth of the church and the gift of the Holy Spirit and Pentecost. They were there. They were eyewitnesses to all of that. Why is that important? That the Gospels and the New Testament are written at a time when the eyewitnesses were still alive. The Gospels were written and circulated in a time when these eyewitnesses, if, if it were not true, the eyewitnesses would have shut it down. If it were not true... And the eyewitnesses, they would have been in an uproar. The Gospels would have never survived. But here they are in our Bible. They're included. It's so important, the fact that the Gospels were written and circulated in a time when there were so many eyewitnesses still living. So many that had seen what Jesus did with their very own eyes. If it were not true, they would have been in an uproar. The Gospels would have never survived. I want you to consider this. I can remember uh, in college, I went to Catawba, just right up the street in Salisbury. But I can remember one of my professors saying this, and at the time I thought it was just crazy talk. He said that there would come a time when all the Holocaust survivors had died away, had passed away. That there would come a time after all the Holocaust survivors had passed away, that there would be a rise in conspiracy theories. People saying that the Holocaust never happened. And at the time, I said, oh, that, that's crazy talk. That, 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 who would say that? But here we are. And just about all the Holocaust survivors have passed. And what have we seen? This rise of conspiracy theorists. People saying that it, it didn't happen. But church, it, it happened. It happened. On a side note, my great-grandfather, literally my grandfather who's sitting right there, his father was put in a concentration camp. Not because he was Jewish, but because he was in the Dutch army. When the Nazis invaded Holland, they made the Dutch soldiers choose. You could either go and fight with the Nazis or we'll put you in a concentration camp. And my great-grandfather refused to fight with the Nazis put him in a concentration camp. Can you imagine someone saying to him that that wasn't real? That was just a conspiracy theory. He saw it with his own eyes. He saw the atrocities with his own eyes. Now, thankfully, my great-grandfather didn't die in there. He was, it was towards the end of the war, and he was able to escape. But can you imagine someone trying to say, no, that didn't happen. No, he, he was an eyewitness. He he saw it with his own eyes. In fact, the atrocities that he saw in his own eyes, he challenged him to take his young family and board a boat and come to America. To get away from that evil. He saw it with his own eyes. Church, the Gospels are considered reliable because of the eyewitnesses. Two eyewitness accounts two friends of eyewitnesses, and it was circulated in a time when there were eyewitnesses living. If it were not so, if it were not true, they would have been in an uproar. The Gospels would have never survived. The fact that it was written and circulated in a time when there were so many eyewitnesses, that is so, so important. So back to Scripture. We take Scripture seriously. We take the Old Testament seriously because Jesus took it seriously. We take 
Jesus seriously because Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and James and Paul, they took Jesus seriously. So the next time you're encountering one of those hit and run comments or hit and run question, here's how you can answer. Here's the end of the sentence. You can say, well, that, that's a good point or that's a good question. But, but for me, it's simple. I believe Jesus died for my sin and he rose from the dead. But I don't believe it just because the Bible says so. It's way better than that. I believe it because Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and James and Paul, they all said so. They were eyewitnesses. They saw it with their own eyes. Church life can cause us to doubt. But our foundation is not in our personal experience. The foundation of our faith is not even the Bible. The foundation of our faith is Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. I believe that Jesus died for my sin and he rose from the dead. But I don't believe it just because the Bible says so. It's way better than that. I believe it because Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and Peter, and James, and Paul, they say so. And they were there. They were eyewitnesses. Church, be prepared. Be prepared. When you go out, when you leave this place, you'll encounter the world. Be ready to stand up, to, to give a defense, to give an answer, to tell them why you have chosen to follow Jesus. Be prepared. I hope you join us next week. Uh, we're going to continue this sermon series, actually wrap up this sermon series. And I'm, I'm hoping to be practical. I'm hoping to give you those sound bites, those short answers that you give that, that can change the, the trajectory of the, of the conversation. Next week, we're going to look at a, a tough issue. It's called theodicy. That's the big uh, theological word, theodicy. How can God allow bad things to happen to good people? That's a tough question. Why do bad things happen to good people? We're going to wrestle with that next week. So I hope you can make it. You don't want to miss it. Let me pray for us as we finish today. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for the, the scriptures. Thank you for the men and women who penned these words, in some cases gave their lives so that we could have them. Lord, thank you for the confidence that, that they had as eyewitnesses. Lord, thank you for the confidence that we have. Father, give us the words. Lord, give us the opportunities to take what we've learned and to share it with people that just need a little more hope, that need a little more Jesus. People who really want to believe. Father, I pray that you would use us to invite people back into an experience with the grace of God, who loves all of us. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able. We're going to close our song with hymn number 430. O oh, Master, let me walk with thee. Stand as you're able to sing. <laughs> Thank you.
go forth today, let's remember when we're asked to be prepared, when we're asked, what is the answer that you have to the question, why do you follow Jesus? Let's be prepared to say, well, for me it's simple. I believe Jesus died for my sin and he, he rose from the dead. But it's, it's more than that. I believe it not just because the Bible says so. I believe it because Matthew and Mark and Luke and James and John and Paul, they all saw it. And they were eyewitnesses. Let's go forth to serve him. To proclaim his name to all the world. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.